good evening and uh, welcome to this uh, panel on supply side liberalisation. We're going to kick off and uh, wait for the remaining, uh, rather than wait for the remaining two speakers. Uh, many of you might have listened to the Radio 4's analysis programme on Austrian economics last week. And in an exemplary piece of BBC editing, the programme ended with Lord Skidelsky, uh, who's not an Austrian sympathiser, saying the problem is that Austrians have absolutely nothing to say about the bust. Well, that's completely untrue. Uh, Austrians argue that uh, in a recession you need radical supply-side supply liberalisation so that the resources that get misallocated in the boom um, are then reallocated again in, in um, the, the period of recession and the economy uh, begins to grow. And for some time uh, at the IEA we've agreed with the coalition that the deficit needs to be reduced um, but we've not been convinced that the coalition government entirely understands um, this essential supply side uh, message and its actions relating to labour market regulation, the minimum wage, energy policy, financial regulation uh, and so on all seem to have been somewhat retrograde, although we may hear a different perspective on that um, this evening. Anyway, with that in mind, we wanted to um, um, call in some experts to discuss supply-side liberalisation. Uh, and um, I shall call the panel in alphabetical order, and each of the panellists will speak for about seven minutes, and then we'll have a, a Q&A uh, and discussion. So we'll start with uh, Richard Barkham, who's on my left. Richard is Group Research Director at the Grosvenor Group, where he's responsible for economic research and analysis, long-term planning and capital allocation. And before, that, before um, going to the Grosvenor Group, uh, Richard was lecturer um, in uh, real estate at the University of Reading. Um, then we'll have Andrew Lidiker, who's not here yet, uh, who is um, a, a, a um, Director of Europe Economics, which is a, a consultancy, and until recently he was Chief Economist at Policy Exchange and is a member of the IEA's Shadow Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, thirdly, John Redwood will uh, speak. Um, John, I'm sure, is known to you all. He's the MP for Workingham and currently Chairman of the Conservative Economic Affairs Committee uh, and was um, in the major government, was Secretary of State for Wales and before that he was um, Head of uh, Mrs Thatcher's Number 10 uh, Policy Unit. Uh, fourthly, uh, we'll have uh, Professor... Well, Professor J.R. Shackleton, uh, who was until last month Dean of University of East London Business School, and he's an IEA author who exposed the myth of the gender pay gap. Uh, Matt Sinclair mm. joined the Taxpayers Alliance uh, in May 2007, and then became Research Director in December 2008, and in 2010 um, Matt took over as uh, Director of the uh, TPA from Matthew Elliott. And sixthly, We'll have um, uh, the Right Honourable Andrew Tyree, who's the MP for Chichester and Chairman of the Treasury Select Committee. And before uh, becoming an MP, uh, Andrew had been advisor to uh, two Chancellors of the Exchequer and Senior Economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And then um, uh, finally, in a, an appalling act of alphabetical discrimination against uh, Mungo, um, uh, Mungo Wilson will speak, and he's a lecturer in financial economics at Side uh, Business School. Before uh, uh, going to Side Business School, Mungo was a visiting lecturer at the LSE and assistant professor at Hong Kong University, where they have no problem with supply-side economics at all, I should imagine. Um, Much of an inheritance. Uh, we are in a mess. If we look at the magnitude of the task before us, it is grave and huge. A country which has a stated public sector debt of a trillion, which has another 1.3 trillion of banking debt on the nation's balance sheet because they were nationalised, about a trillion or so of unfunded pension obligations, and a few hundred billion of assorted PFI, PPP and contingent loans and guarantees. Uh, so we're getting on for four trillion uh, of money at risk and debt in the public sector and the economy is one and a half trillion. So it's quite a task to start to control that, and the task of the coalition government in its uh, first period of office, this parliament, is merely to get to the point where it's no longer rising. Uh, we need to get rid of this funny idea that we're going to start paying down the debt or we're going to eliminate the deficit. The plan, the five-year plan, if all goes well, 
uh, is that the state of public debt will only have gone up from 1 trillion to 1.4 trillion over that time period, and, and by the time we get to the next election, the debt will be stable, and then we have to think about <coughs> repaying it. Uh, we've seen the balance of payments figures for the last year today, uh, 96 billion deficit for the year as a whole in trading goods, and a 42 billion deficit for trade overall. We've seen the latest money supply figures, uh, M4 actually still contracting, despite the extraordinary monetary actions undertaken uh, in recent months and the very low level of interest rates. And we've now had the deal with the banks announced in an effort to kickstart uh, the small and medium-sized enterprise sector and to get more jobs created. The trend rate of growth, when I wrote the uh, 2007 Economic Policy Review for the Conservative Party with friends and colleagues, uh, we thought was now only 1.5%. We felt that the economy had been so damaged by the regulations and tax increases of the preceding years, and we would be doing quite well to achieve a trend rate of growth of 1.2% if you start the trend at the two th 2007 peak. Uh, we, if we're going well, we will get back to 2007 levels of output and activity by about 2012, and then we can go on and try and create some extra prosperity to tackle the debt. So what needs to be done? Uh, well, uh, the IEA invited the right group of people, I'm sure, because uh, we will agree tonight that we need a supply-side revolution, and for that we need lower and competitive taxes, for that we need considerably fewer regulations, we need to cut the costs on business by getting rid of some of the needless or less desirable regulations of which there are all too many. Uh, we need to start constructing some proper infrastructure, we need more roads, we may need more railway lines, we certainly need more power stations, we need better broadband grid, and that has got to be paid for wholly or mainly in the private sector. The government does have a role because it has to grant the planning commissions the licenses and maybe give things a kick start in this very socialised economy we now live in, but it's very important that it's done by entrepreneurial hands using mainly private money because we can't afford to do it all in the public sector. Uh, in the little time that I can reasonably take, I would just concentrate on one topic, which is banks. We need to move on from the basher bank rhetoric, and I'm sufficient of a politician to know why it's popular, and I'm a sufficient of an economist to know that if we don't get the banks right and work with them, nothing is going to work. So we need to move on from the the rhetoric, uh, to making sure they are fixed. And of course I'm delighted if, if there is now an agreement to increase business lending and to increase small business lending, to increase small business uh, venture capital effectively, and to generally beef things up. But I don't think it's all going to work um, over the next few years unless we also, also sort out banking regulation. And why is it that money is still contracting when they've printed so much of it and bought in so many public bonds at very advantageous prices to the vendors? And I think the answer is very simple. That whilst they now talk the language of counter-cyclical regulation for the banks, uh, they are reinforcing the cycle. Uh, when I wrote the Economic Policy Review in 2007, before the credit crunch, we concluded, and it was very obvious, quite a lot of politicians saw it, so it was obviously very obvious. Um, it was very obvious in 2007 there was too much credit, that interest rates were too low, that there was too much money sloshing around, and they should have done something about it. But we foresaw the next move, so we said in the report, but if they withdraw the credit too quickly, if they hike interest rates too far, too fast, and hold them there, we will go from the very unpleasant situation where there's too much inflation and too much activity to the even worse situation where there is too little activity and a major collapse, that it is quite possible, we said, to bring these banks down, such as the overextension of credit. That was exactly what the authorities foolishly decided to do. So they made the second set of regulatory mistakes. They were too lax on the way up. They were too severe on the way down. Indeed, the regulators in 0809 were literally undermining the banks by conducting a public discussion of how dreadful they were and encouraging runs on them. I, I've never seen anything so absurd and so damaging in my life and greatly increased the top cost to the British taxpayers. And even now, when we need banks that are supportive and when we need credit for business, uh, they are fighting the last war but one 
and saying now is the time to tighten regulation on the banks. So you've got regulation pointing in the opposite direction to the government policy of being a little bit easier on the credit. They also now, of course, have the added complication that they have to control inflation. And I think their interest rates have been too low for too long now, whilst their credit restrictions have been too tight. So you've had a quantity problem pointing in one direction, too little activity. You've had a price situation pointing to too much inflation. And the mechanism has been uh, they've allowed the pound to fall too far. And it's because they've kept interest rates too low, I think, that they've allowed the pound to fall so far. We didn't need it to fall that far to be able to export what capacity we've got. We don't have that much manufacturing capacity that we need to fill. Uh, but we are importing a huge amount of inflation as a result. That is why our inflation is so much higher than German inflation or Japanese inflation or American inflation, because we, we made that mistake. So I think fix the banks, fix the regulations of the banks. Personally, I would split up RBS and Lloyd's H. Boss now that they are in the public sector, because I think we need bank more banking competition. And we need to get some more smaller banks in who are willing to bank the unbanked and the smaller businesses, because a lot of the big banks don't seem very interested in that. That will be crucial to our supply side revolution. Uh, you don't have to be an adherent to the labour theory of value to realise that all economic activity involves employing people. If we want to expand output, therefore, we need to make it as easy as possible for employment uh, to be generated. So a key element, in my view, in promoting supply-side improvements in the UK economy has to be the loosening up of employment regulation. Although the UK still has a rather freer labour market than some of its competitors. This has been a wasting asset. The last few years have been seen a considerable extension of employment regulation. Uh, the Index of Economic Freedom, which was published recently, which the, you can find the details on the IEA website, uh, the, the, the Labour Freedom Index there for the UK fell from, uh, it's not worth going into how this is calculated, but it fell from a figure of 80 in 2009 to 71.2 this year, as a result of new restrictions which have been placed on employment. Increased employment regulation raises the predictable costs of employing labour, things like the minimum wage, for example, things like the compliance costs, the, the huge expansion of the HR industry, which um, I, I was looking at some figures um, uh, earlier today, from 1998 to 2004, the, the uh, proportion of uh, private companies which employed HR specialists rose by a third in that period and has been rising, of course, even more uh, since 2004. So there are these kind of direct costs of, of regulation, but there are also the more pernicious costs, I think, of, the, of increasing the risks associated with taking on new people. Uh, people who may not be up to scratch, uh, but can be very difficult indeed to get rid of uh, if, they, if they turn out uh, to, to be duds. Um, there are also a whole range of, of regulations now where people are given the right to request, which is a, a recipe, of course, for tribunal cases because nobody, employers have no idea what the risk associated with refusing uh, one of these uh, requests will be. So employers continually draw our attention uh, to the problems of, uh, that they face with new employment regulation. And, you know, the, the, the figures that employment tribunals back this up. Last year, 230,000 uh, cases going, to tribunals, uh, uh, going, going through the tribunal system. Uh, an incredible increase on 10 or 20 years ago. These costs and uncertainties associated with employment regulation <laughs> fall particularly, I think, on smaller businesses. Uh, as the IOD has recently said, any growth strategy for small and medium-sized enterprises that doesn't deal with employment law isn't worth the paper it's written on. The coalition, of course, has shown some awareness of this problem, and Vince Cable uh, revealed some, uh, uh, some, some uh, proposals for, for consultation recently. Uh, one is to increase the time before unfair dismissal kicks in from one year to two years. Some reforms to employment tribunals, including possibly the introduction of a fee for people using them and so forth. Well, welcome. These measures, I've had a look at the, 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 you know, all, all, the, the, the existing caseload of, of tribunals, and in my view, 
um, there will be very little impact, at least in the short run. There may be some impact on the psychology of employers, but in terms of the type of cases which are going forward, I don't think these kind of reforms are going to make a great deal of difference. So we want something, I think, a lot stronger than that. Now, one, one, one thing which you continually come across in discussions about this is, is the role of Europe uh, in, in relation to employment regulation. It's certainly true that since we signed up the, to the Social Charter and oh, Social Chapter and so forth under the Blair administration, we have become uh, tied to uh, European trends in this direction. Um, nevertheless, I think we are a bit soft about trying to challenge some of these issues. And there are many, many areas of employment regulation where we could make significant changes uh, without uh, the, Euro the European Commission being able to do anything about it at all at the European Court. Um, for example, there's no European requirement to have a minimum wage, a national minimum wage. We could have, uh, and certainly no requirement that we should uprate it regularly as we do. We could have regionalised a minima, for example, which is the one suggestion that has been put forward. Or we could just have no national minimum wage at all. Uh, it's not required uh, by, by European law. Uh, we could abandon national collective bargaining in the public sector. There's nothing the European Commission could do about that. We could place greater restrictions on unions' ability to call strikes. It's nothing the European, uh, the European Union could do about that. Less dramatically, we could reduce much of the kind of bureaucracy which has grown up recently, uh, homegrown bureaucracy, about uh, forming employment contracts. Uh, if, you, if, if you've employed uh, anybody recently, you know what a rigmarole it is you have to go through. You have to take photocopies of their passports and all this kind of business, which for people who've been working, in the, who were born here, been working here for 30 years, etc., you've still got to go through this rigmarole. Uh, that you, you take a photocopy of the passport and the people send it back because it's no, you know, the, the, the image isn't clear enough or something like that. All that kind of rigmarole um, <laughs> is, is something which we could well do without. CRB checks, which have expanded to encompass people who never come within miles of children, and yet they have to be, uh, they have to be uh, checked in this way and all that kind of uh, business. We could get rid of that kind of stuff. It's nothing to do with the European Union. <coughs> One area I want to focus on very quickly as I, as I finish is the whole business of equality legislation, which of course is one of the areas which is supported by, uh, by, by, by European law, um, but we have a great deal of freedom and manoeuvre within that, I think. We now have laws against discrimination which encompass gender, race, ethnic status, age, disability, religious or other beliefs or no beliefs, sexual orientation, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity. I may have missed something out, but there, that covers a lot, of, a lot of people there. These areas are protected at the European level, so we can't easily turn our back on them. But I believe we have over-regulated, we have, we have gold-plated a lot of these requirements um, uh, to an extent which is not matched with most other uh, European Union countries, if indeed in any of them. Our own excesses could be cut back without falling foul of European obligations. I'll give you three examples. First of all, we do not need as elaborate and expensive an apparatus as the Equality and Human Rights Commission, in addition to a government equalities office, to enforce these laws. Um, the, 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 um, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission currently employs over 500 FTE people. God knows how many that is in, in, in heads, probably over 1,000, I should think. Um, it costs us £60 million pounds a year. Are we getting good value for this? Do we need this? Even Trevor Phillips, I see on, on the telly the other day, is having some, he's, he's backpedalling on this, and in fact, some things we could do with some slimmed down process. Well, we certainly could. Secondly, we're not obliged to impose the heavy handed public sector equality duty, which requires extensive and expensive monitoring and action plans in an, a, a Sisyphean uh, attempt to. Uh, roll back uh, in inequality uh, in all dimensions. Um, this duty, incidentally, covers a whole range of institutions which aren't actually counted in the public sector for public account purposes. It includes uh, universities, uh, some professional bodies, charities, and voluntary organisations. We could cut back on that and save a lot of, uh, of trouble and, and, and cost. And the third area, and I've spoken about this before here, I think, is we are not obliged to award compensation without limit for discrimination claims. Whereas compensation for straight unfair dismissal is capped at around £70,000 at the moment, um, with discrimination, the sky's the limit. 
And this sometimes produces bizarre outcomes which uh, Parliament can never have intended, and certainly which the British public do not support. For instance, last year, the biggest payout for disability, nearly three quarters of a million pounds, was for a journalist who claimed that he was bullied to the extent that the stress made him unable to work. This contrasts, to my mind, very uneasily with the paltry sums which we give to serving soldiers who lose limbs in defense of the country. Or to take last year's biggest race discrimination compensation, around 350,000 pounds. This was not for, uh, as you might think, for somebody from an ethnic minority or whatever. Um, it was for an English banker who was denied promotion in a French bank. <laughs> Discrimination, uh, I think, uh, can remain illegal. It probably should remain illegal in most of these cases. But there is absolutely no reason why these claims should not be capped in the same way as unfair dismissal. And this would reduce a lot of the fear, I think, amongst employers uh, about getting it wrong in relation to all these protected groups which I listed before. <coughs> okay, well, I'm not, what I'm suggesting here is that the coalition needs to be much more uh, imaginative and ambitious if it wants to make a real impact in turning back the tide of employment regulation, which burdens employers, raises costs, and, I would argue, deters job creation. It may, incidentally, of course, also generate new forms of discrimination as employers try to avoid groups of employees who may present problems as they exercise a vague and unclear employment rights. Thank you. Where I'd start from on the growth agenda is being clear about the scale of our problem. I think we need to not overstate it, but equally not underestimate it. So if you look at Britain and compare it to other European countries, unemployment's quite low. Uh, these are sort of the latest Eurostat figures, about 8% here, about 10% in the Eurozone. Uh, inflation's quite high, 3.3% against 1.9%. Uh, if you uh, put those together for a sort of back of the envelope min misery index, you get to about 11.1 for us, about 12 for the Eurozone. What I suggest is that we're, we're having a pretty ordinary, miserable European recovery. Uh, we're, having, we, we're not doing as well as the Germanys of this world, but we're doing pretty similar to countries like France. Now, what that tells you is that we're not in a catastrophe. What it equally tells you, though, is that we are facing a... Facing, uh, we have facing a fairly dismal prospects of becoming one more member of that slightly declining Eurozone club. I think, I think if we were to look back 10 years and say Britain will enjoy a Europe economic performance similar to the Eurozone, we wouldn't have seen it as a compliment. That's the kind of position we're in now. So we shouldn't be enthused, but equally we shouldn't be uh, Christ the word. Now, the problem we're going to have is essentially that an extended fiscal crisis, it's not going to end now, so it's going to continue because we have public services set up in such a way that as people want to spend more on health, as people want to spend more on education, as the population ages, it's going to put particular pressure on our public finances. There's going to be an ongoing difficulty in doing a lot of the things we'd want to do to help the health business. Uh, so there's going to be, uh, it's going to be, continue to be difficult to do things like tax reform, which we need to do, but that's because it's difficult. It's why the Taxpayers Alliance new uh, tax commission is the 2020 tax commission, is because it's very hard to do these things quickly when there's such pressures on the public finances. At the same time, there's been a lot of pressure on household budgets. So expecting a lot from the increasingly uh, burdened British consumer is going to be hard. Now, what I'd say that leaves us in the position of is we need to look for opportunities which aren't costing the exchequer or even free up money within the exchequer, and which can improve, give us, give up, which we can take. So we've got those opportunities to do that without hitting the fiscal, uh, the fiscal issue. Now, you can see some, like, we can't afford a tax rate which loses revenue. If the 50p rate increases the amount we need to raise from ordinary families, or increases the burden needs to be pressured on the business, as well as being a burden in itself, it has to be necessary to abandon it. And that's what most of the independent forecasters have found, the IFS and CEPR. Uh, at the same time, can we afford a massive rise, uh, about 3.7 billion, or about a third of its budget, in the international development budget. Uh, this we are talking about that the area of spending the public most want to see cut, the government is going to massively increase, which raises questions not only about and equally an area which 
doesn't affect household budgets or business costs. And so it's an area where you can make some progress on the fiscal issue without hitting those sort of economic drivers. Now, the one biggest area I think like this, and this is the one uh, Philip's asked me to talk about, uh, is the and is energy and climate change policy, which constitutes, I think, the very biggest example of this kind of thing, where we're leaving opportunity on the table. I think a couple of the other areas people talk about are exactly the same. Opportunities we're leaving on the table, which we need to take. Now, you're talking here, to put a scale on it, Citigroup expects that between now and 2020, we're going to need to invest about 161 billion euros to meet, uh, they can nominate things in euros because they're looking at it internationally, to meet uh, environmental targets. Which it compares to sort of about 77 billion, we need to invest to keep the lights on. This is just in the energy sector. And that 161 billion is more than Germany, France, and Italy combined will need to invest to meet these targets. The best theory I've heard as to why is that Blair didn't know the difference between energy and electricity, so he signed up to a target which is just mad. <laughs> now, the, what it, now, what we're, that means is in, investing all that money has to pay for it. So you're going to see energy company profits are going to have to go up, therefore prices are going to have to go up, by about 52% according to Citigroup. They think you can take a little of the edge off with efficiency, but you'll still get a very substantial increase and you have to pay for the efficiency gains. So it's even more of a crunch right now, between now and 2020, which is so critical. Now, it does the same to business costs. Business costs are likely to go up even more. Uh, entirely possible you'll see business energy costs uh, double, which will very substantially affect industrial customers. Now, these policies aren't efficient, they aren't effective. And we're talking about the emissions trading scheme. Uh, fraud is just one of the issues with it. Fraud is made up with 5 billion euros in a, uh, in a carousel <coughs> fraud scheme. At the moment, it's actually suspended across most of Europe mm. because they have so little confidence in their regime. Like hairdressers in Darlington are suddenly, are suddenly being uh, recorded as uh, traders in the emissions trading scheme because the things aren't wanted to do. I'm registered in Denmark. Um, the, and you're talking about schemes, and the price is so volatile that this market-based solution the government thing they have, it's not a market, it's not a market in any, se in any sense of the way, way, it's having to have its price fixed. The government are legislating to fix the price of this, and uh, of their market-based solution, which makes all those <coughs> traders and all that fraud a complete, a complete, not a completely unnecessary, because it's a system we have no trust to do its basic job, which is to set the carbon price. Renewable energy, utterly unaffordable. £100 per megawatt hour for offshore wind, which is double what energy, will, what energy will often sell for on wholesale markets. That's offshore wind, which is phenomenally expensive, and that's the biggest source of the new costs. But some board sources, feed in tariffs, well over half the capacity that's being installed is people putting solar panels on their roof. They'll get £400 per megawatt hour in the feeding subsidy. These subsidies are ineffective because no, the, the big emitters aren't going to follow that example. If this costs £100 per megawatt hour, if it costs £400 per megawatt hour, other people aren't going to use it, or not use it on any significant scale. They're not going to use it on a scale such they're replacing what they're mostly building, which is coal. And that means what we're going to do is not cut emissions, but drive uh, industries and jobs abroad. Now, it'll be major intensive, energy intensive industries, chemicals, which are not an old industry. They've been steadily increasing their capacity in recent decades. Uh, Chemicals are going to be destroyed by this. We're talking about industries which often have energy as a third, half, or more of their costs. Uh, but not just them. Uh, regular businesses are facing... The, we've, told, we've talked a lot about double taxation over the years. Lots of businesses in Britain are going to face double cap and trade because they're going to have the emissions trading scheme and then the carbon reduction commitment, which even the Department of Energy and Climate Change doesn't understand, which effectively is a new little cap, little cap and trade scheme for on non-energy intensive businesses which <coughs> deals with energy which has already been cap and traded and had renewable energy subsidies it has to be paid for through the emissions trading scheme. We are talking about these hugely expensive policies. Now, we're going to need manufacturing. Uh, whether or not you think that rebalancing the economy should be an objective, we're going to need it with politicians vandalising the city. So, I think that we should at least set the bar at not destroying manufacturing. I don't want an industrial policy, I just don't want an anti-industrial <laughs> policy. To slightly yeah, yeah, paraphrase yeah, 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 something yeah, yeah. Nigel Lawson uses all the time, about an anti-energy policy. Uh, but the, so we're going to need it. And other countries aren't going to follow the example. So what we're going to do is drive these studies emissions abroad. And at the same time, and, you know, some will acknowledge they want a planned recession. That's a term that's been used. But politicians aren't going to talk about it that way. They know that 
people have seen an unplanned recession, they're not going to, you can't sell a planned recession. So they're trying to convince people this is good for us, this is going to help us to seize the markets of the future. The problem with that is buying lots of copies of Microsoft Office won't make you Bill Gates. Making ourselves a big customer for wind turbines and solar panels won't make us a big supplier. The best case for a developed economy being able to build green jobs is Germany, which had an established expertise, an established sector here, which could do well out of it. They are widely thought to have lost jobs, and indeed, if you look at a company like Q-Cells, which is collapsing, the solar industry is literally facing collapse. And these are the best case. We are far from the best case for these kinds of things working. So anyone who gets a green job will have to, if they are being honest, be very aware that a couple of other people have paid for it with theirs. That is what green jobs constitute. Now, yeah. the reason why I think it is so important to talk about this area is that we, this is an area that treasury types tend to ignore. People are very concerned with economic growth, with fiscal policy, 90% of the time. We like to think of it because you get a lot of aggro from Greenpeace and you'd rather think about other things. We can't because it will undo our other objectives. We're not going to be able to deal with benefit dependency if you're hiking one of the biggest costs for poor and elderly families. We're not going to be able to rebalance the economy by dealing with other constraints on manufacturing if we're massively hiking their energy costs. We need to start paying attention to this. Because it, it, and there are, it doesn't mean we need to be getting into arguments about the science of climate change. Don't do it. It's a waste of time. You're not credible. It means you need to say there's a better way, focus on technology, adaptation, resilience. But we've got to start taking this area uh, seriously, or it will undo all of our other economic and social objectives. It's that much money, it can really lay waste to all of them. Well, that was the last item that I had on my list, so I might as well begin where uh, you ended. Uh, I completely agree with every word of that. That's why I was one of only five MPs to um, vote against the climate change bill. Um, and it's unusual, of course, finding yourself in the in a lobby with only five people, and on the other side you've got uh, 450. Um, but uh, that's what that experience was like that night. Uh, I, com I completely agree with everything you've said. I would just add a few riders to it. First of all, it's an illustration of the extent to which the battle to make the supply side work effectively uh, needs to be thought of like a tropical thicket. You leave it alone for a little while, and it will grow up remorselessly. Ways will be found to make the supply side work less effectively. The new tropical thicket is being justified by a new uh, rhetoric uh, um, about a sort of a smart blue-green approach to the economy that is as yet unproven. Uh, I think it's very important that we analyse uh, extremely carefully the so-called new agenda that is appearing uh, from uh, parts of not only this government but a number of other governments uh, around the world. I, 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 let me identify some specific areas which we, we need to look at. We've heard some talk about the need to re-examine um, performance of the country on grounds of well-being, that we need a new measure, uh, well-being, to sit alongside GDP. When I heard this, I thought, well, I don't mind asking the ONS to spend half a million. I do, I do mind, actually, but, I, but if they're going to spend half a million doing this, that's okay. When I heard that this might lead to a re-examination of the Green Book, for those of you who know what we're talking about, we're talking about the Treasury rationale for a single discount rate for all future public sector projects, then I became very concerned indeed. And that is what we have now got to, uh, all of us, um, start thinking about the risks of taking place. Organisations like the IEA have got to get deep into what's really going on on project appraisal. Uh, on the supply side of the economy in the energy field. What we're really doing is creating on energy what we had on agriculture. It is the new scandal. Energy is taking over yeah. from, the, yeah. from the common agricultural policy of the last 40 years when we all used to troop in the IEA when I was uh, about your age or a bit younger uh, and we'd say how shocking this policy was and how much damage it was doing around the world, <laughs> which to some degree it still is. I agree with everything you said about aid and a number of other issues. Um, uh, 
I, but I, let me just touch on a few other things very, very quickly in, in the time remaining available to me. The tax system is in an absolutely dire mess, mm. really dire mess. HMRC is perilously close to being a failing institution. We took evidence from some leading practitioners on the Treasury Select Committee uh, uh, this earlier this week. It was absolutely appalling to hear their stories about how complicated it's become uh, to make the tax system work. Just the physical size of the tax code and its growth, again, it's very much the tropical thicket uh, scenario. It requires a great deal of action to repair. Um, the um, lack of competition is another major area which we've got to address in the banking sector, picking up on what John said earlier. I, that's why we're doing a, a the Treasury Select Committee is doing a report into retail the banking. The SME lending is certainly not functioning properly in the country at the moment, but rather than bashing banks, I completely agree. What we've got to do is find a way of getting back to a more uh, normal banking market. Uh, on regulation, again, just look at the scale of the cost of compliance uh, under the Financial Services and Markets Act. I very much hope that we're going to take the opportunity as we um, redesign regulation to do something uh, about the cost of regulation in, uh, in, in financial markets. We need effective regulation, not just more regulation. Um, uh, the housing market's been mentioned very briefly. Uh, on the housing market, just look at MMR, those of you know what we're talking about, the mortgage review. Uh, the mortgage review produced by the, uh, uh, by the FSA is a heap of new regulation which is going to reduce the efficiency of the mortgage market and make it more difficult for um, uh, labour mobility to take place in this country. Again, it needs to be addressed. One word that's not been mentioned at all, that I was, what I was describing there was um, uh, uh, domestic migration, but we also need to look at immigration uh, policy as well, keep a very close eye on that. Uh, I am getting representations from a number of uh, large institutions telling me that uh, there's a skills shortage growing up as a consequence of the new uh, rules on uh, immigration. It's a very sensitive subject, but I certainly think uh, that that needs a supply uh, agenda approach. And just very lastly, of course, the labour market is absolutely crucial, and I agree with all the sentiments that came forward from Professor Shackleton. I'm not sure I'd want to be the first politician to leap forward suggesting that we need to uh, wind up all national collective bargaining, take on immediately the minimum wage, and those sorts of issues. That sounds like a, a heady agenda uh, to me, uh, whatever now may lie, lie behind it. But some of your other ideas, uh, looking again at the way employment contracts are drawn up, d discrimination for compensation claims, putting a cap on them, uh, and a number of other ideas that it, you came forward with, I think the government should put pretty high on its agenda soon. But if there's one thought I want to leave you with, it's the one I began with, is that the, there is a new agenda for a type of interventionism in government policy in Britain at the moment, which itself will be sclerotic for the supply side, and it needs very, very careful monitoring, much more attention than it's had hitherto. It's not only it's in the energy field, it's not only in the energy field, and it will be very expensive and undo all the good work we do in or try to do in every other area. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, um, it's uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, actually, uh, not Hong Kong University. Hong Kong University is a higher ranked university overall, but HKUST is a much higher ranked business school. <laughs> um, still. Uh, anyway, I'm not there anymore. I'm at Oxford, and um, uh, it's a slightly unnerving task this because I'm a financial economist, and uh, because I trained in the States, and then worked in Asia, I know virtually nothing about the UK. So when I was asked to uh, talk about how to improve the competitiveness of the UK economy, I thought I'd go for an easy topic, which is um, how to improve labour mobility within the UK, partly which includes domestic migration, thinking that that one was pretty obvious. You know, we've got... Uh, the, my prejudice is uh, same as my colleagues uh, uh, at university, I was pleased to discover. I asked my colleague Alan Morrison what I should talk about. He said, oh, just talk about stamp duty and housing benefit, and it's how it's trapping people in depressed regions and preventing them from going to uh, booming regions. And uh, that was my prior belief as well. Now I no longer believe that. So um, 
having looked at the facts today at our excellent ONS uh, website. So um, I'll, I'll tell you the argument in favour, and then I'll tell you what I find puzzling about it, and then we can take it from there. Uh, so it'll be a much more academic uh, sort of talk than you've had so far. Um, obviously, um, if, we had a, if we had barriers to domestic migration, or barriers keeping people at home when they'd like to be in work, like the inability to expense uh, childcare costs, or uh, some reason why you uh, found it difficult to get out of a dead-end career in a low productivity industry and into a much better career in a higher uh, productivity industry, they're all barriers to mobility. Um, the first one, the most obvious one, is geographic. And um, uh, the, uh, here's a headline fact. So um, the region with the lowest um, employment rate is, of course, the Northeast, which is worrying because it's got a very high fraction of government employees, public sector employees, and that's where the cuts are going to fall. And the region with the highest employment rate is the Southeast, it's 74%. So wouldn't it be great if all those people in the Northeast could move and find work in the South, like Norman Tebbit recommended years ago? And, uh, of course, uh, the obvious candidates that are preventing them are housing benefit. You, you go to the back of the queue when you move if you're poor, stamp duty if you're middle class, you can't, and negative equity, you can't sell your house because mm -hmm. you can't afford to buy another one. And um, these are problems. But there's a puzzle, which is that the um, spread in employment and unemployment rates is much bigger locally than between regions nationally. Um, and I'll give you an example. This, uh, this is uh, Curtis of the NS. In West Leicester, northwest Leicestershire, the employment rate is a staggering 80.8%. That's the East Midlands. The unemployment rate is 5.3%. It's pretty close, I would guess, to the natural rate of unemployment. Uh, in Nottingham, which uh, I've established by looking at Google, is 40 minutes drive away up the M1. Uh, the um, unemployment rate is 12.7%. So it's, that's, uh, that's the highest in the UK. 12.7% versus 5.3%, 40 minutes drive away. Employment rate of 55.5%. That suggests that actually it's not barriers to domestic migration, such as housing benefit, stamp duty, and negative equity, which are the problem, but that the, the, the potential workers of Nottingham are not suitable to do the jobs in northwest Leicestershire. And therefore, in a way, my prejudice was wrong. I was remembering an article by Patrick Minford written years ago where he refreshingly observed that if we abolished housing benefit and uh, unrestricted planning permission, we could wipe out unemployment in the UK. This is in the 1980s when it was a big problem. I don't, I don't think that's, that's right now. So then it must be the case that um, they don't have the right skills. So what other skills um, that are possessed in northwest Leicestershire that um, are not possessed in Nottingham, 40 minutes drive away? Well, I don't know the answer, but I can make a few guesses, again, based on prejudice. Um, somebody mentioned manufacturing. Well, in, I, I looked at the, at, the, at the sectors where there have been major changes in employment. Um, for about two decades ago, which is for, to show you how old I am, about when I left university. So in 1992, manufacturing accounted for 15% of all employment in the UK, and services accounted for 73%. So we were already a highly dependent service, on services back then. Um, in 2010, manufacturing had gone from 15% to 8% of all jobs. Services had gone from 73% to 83%, more than offsetting. Um, uh, and that's very broad-based across all kinds of service sectors. I mean, we've, we've mentioned human resources and admin and support, and yes, they have increased employment, uh, and maybe that some of that is wasted work, but I suspect not all of it. Uh, one, one sector, of course, which is huge now is tourism-related work and, um, uh, and, uh, and other things. But um, uh, I may be preaching to the converted here, uh, because I suspect many of you are conservatives. But um, it strikes me that one skill that you must possess in the service sector, which you don't really have to possess in the manufacturing sector to such a high degree, is, is what the Americans call soft skills. And I speak as someone who, who works on an MBA program and a master's in financial economics program at Oxford. In the MBA program, we encourage people to be bright, articulate, well-dressed, and get out there and impress people. In the MFE program, you just have to be able to interact with a computer, and we can get you a job in a hedge fund. Um, so this is great, because we can sell both, but we find it um, very hard to place people uh, who want to make the move fr from the MFE, who want to make the move from the back office to the front office, as they call it, who want to interact with clients, because they don't have any soft skills. Uh, by soft skills, I mean what the, Amer what the Americans mean, the ability to build trust. We would perhaps more conservatively call it, can you speak English and spell properly, and interact with people, and make them understand what you're trying to do for them, so that they trust you and believe that you can do it. And it's possible that, um, I don't want to offend anyone, but I think it's possible that that is what the problem is 
in, and that's why that the, the, the local differences in employment are really rather larger than the, the obvious differences across regions, and that, that may be the major barrier to mobility. The good news is that creating soft skills is easy. Right? We don't need lots of expensive um, experts in uh, you know, computer software or chemistry or anything like that. This is a relatively simple problem to fix, if that is indeed the problem. I'm only speculating. Uh, somebody mentioned broadband. Um, uh, another thing that I've read up about is that um, in future we will all have two jobs, work from home on the internet, and, um, and, uh, and that this is already happening. I, again, I'm not sure the numbers totally bear this out. In 1992, 23% of workers were part-time, 14% self-employed, and 3.8% had second jobs uh, last year. 27% of workers were part-time, 13% um, were self-employed, and 3.8% had second jobs. It's really hardly any change. The only notable change in there is that uh, there must have been a big increase in the number of part-time male workers because the numbers for women, which are different, are um, uh, correspondingly unchanged. There does seem to be some scope for increased self-employment among women who may be those um, mums who are stuck at home uh, because of their inability to pay for childcare, as we learned today. It's now very expensive. And, um, uh, of course, the internet is going to be an opportunity there uh, uh, because new technology will create new jobs. Now, just finish off, somebody mentioned banks. I think you, John Redwood mentioned banks. Um, Labour is, of course, more productive when... Um, by the way, I'm assuming that the literal question this panel is, is designed to answer isn't actually the question posed, because if you want to make the British economy more competitive, it's very simple. You just cut all wages in half. Then you're more competitive. Right? We don't want that. What you presumably mean is how do we become more productive and better at engaging in higher value activities? And um, Labour is more productive when you've got finance. Uh, it's, uh, small businesses probably create a lot more jobs in the future. Uh, um, we need to encourage entrepreneurship um, that can be done from home, um, uh, part-time. Um, and um, it needs finance. Uh, banks aren't just not interested in lending small banks, businesses, big banks. They can't do it. There's a very nice American study, Berger, Miller, Peterson, Rajan, and Stein, which shows that as banks grow, they become unable. They stop lending to small businesses, and particularly they stop lending to businesses which are hard to value because they have more intangible assets. They, um, and that's, that's because of the nature of the organization uh, of large organizations, basically. They, they find it very difficult to acquire the information they need. So we need lots more kinds of small financial intermediation, and that, um, that will come from new technology, companies like Zopa, uh, which, um, and, and small local banks. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>